Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottertune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottertune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Uh, thanks to everyone coming. Uh, welcome to the next session of the Vaccination Database Seminar Series. Uh, today, we're pleased to host uh, Kishore Gopalakrishna. Um, he was he is the, sort of, one of the lead developers of Apache Pino, which was built at LinkedIn while he was there. Um, he's also the co-author of several other notable Apache projects, including Apache Helix um, and Espresso, which actually is not an Apache project, but was an internal distributed database built at LinkedIn. So, uh, as always, we want this to be interactive. So if you have questions for Kishore as he's speaking, please unmute yourself, say who you are, where you're coming from, and uh, ask your question. Again, feel free to interrupt anytime, right? Because otherwise he's, he's talking by himself. Okay? All right, Kishore, the floor is yours. You have an hour, go for it. Thank you. Again, uh, thanks, Andy, for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk here. I have seen all the series here, and this is like uh, one of the best uh, places for me to actually talk about Pino. So I'll, I'll divide this into three main um, chunks. First is like why we built uh, Pinot at LinkedIn. And the second part is uh, giving, giving a little bit of an overview of Pinot. And the third part, I'll dive deep into like the starter index, which is the key part of this uh, talk. Um, one of the key reasons why we built uh, Pinot at LinkedIn is for the user-facing analytics, right? So most of you might be familiar with who viewed my profile that you see on LinkedIn. And anytime you see this, uh, you see some sort of chart like this on LinkedIn, it's uh, basically coming from Pino as the backend. Uh, so we have like 70 plus products um, like this built on um, just on LinkedIn. Uh, across all these, we are seeing somewhere between 170,000 queries per second, right? And uh, just last year, this was like 100,000 100, queries. So the usage of Pino is just continuously growing at LinkedIn. And the, the most challenging part is since this is all user facing, um, the key thing for us to provide here was the latency, right? Even at the scale, we have a requirement of providing milliseconds uh, to subsequent latency for the users. Um, so this is another one, whenever you post an article, you get a real time analytics on top of it. Um, similarly, if you go to any company page, you're seeing the analytics of a company um, and that's again powered by Pino. Right. And if you have a talent analytics, if you're into recruiter, you want to see, or in, even in terms of a company, you want to see where did your folks move? How is your talent pool? Um, so all these things are coming from LinkedIn. So these are like some of the sample apps that were built on top of Pino. Um, so the next section, I'll briefly cover like what actually goes on behind the scenes in terms of building and powering such, uh, such applications. Um, as you see, uh, pretty much everything that you do on LinkedIn, being liking a article or connecting to someone or creating a profile, everything is recorded and is modeled as an actor verb object model, right? So this is the, uh, the classic uh, graph, graph model uh, in terms of showing what's act actually happening on every event. So you can think of a member liking an article, a recruiter emailing someone, or a marketer posting an ad. And typically everyone wants to know more about this in terms of analytics. Um, so what exactly happens with this, right? So why every activity that you do is, you can classify it into either an event data or an entity data. Um, so whenever you create an entity that goes into this database called Espresso, which is like the NoSQL data, data store at LinkedIn, um, very similar to the Cassandra MongoDB, uh, but it is a um, timeline consistent model. So that means, Every, uh, the consistency is actually pretty critical in terms of this database. On the other hand, other side, every activity that you do is actually going into Kafka, which is, um, which is the, the key messaging platform that we use at LinkedIn. So once they get into Kafka and Espresso, we have this mechanism where Pino um, is a, is, uh, actually has this Lambda architecture where you can simply point at Kafka and then you can start querying it in real time. Uh, at the same time, the, uh, the dumps are coming into Hadoop, either from Espresso or from Kafka, and you should be able to still push in a batch mode, right? Every day you can compute it and then update Pino. So you kind of have this hybrid mode that's possible in Pino. You can consume directly from real time. At the same time, you can continuously keep pushing from batch. 
So once you get the data in, in you know, what, one of the key things that we have done is, as, as you already saw, the data products is one of the main reasons why we built um, Pinot at LinkedIn. Uh, apart from that, it's also used for visualization internally um, for, to power all our exit dashboards and the business metrics. Uh, and we also have uh, things like anomaly detection, which is third eye, which constantly keeps querying Pinot and uh, being able to detect uh, anomalies in the data. Um, so this is kind of the, our internal dashboard as well, uh, where we have like 10,000 plus business metrics, 50,000 dimensions across all of them. And people are able to query this and slice and dice. So this is mainly used by internal users at LinkedIn. Uh, this is the um, um, the same set of data, but uh, being able to use uh, being, but we use third eye to actually query this and periodically and then figure out anomalies, right? So it's also not just um, figures out the anomalies, but it also helps you find out why, right? So in this particular case, you can see that it's even highlighting the fact that it's it was Halloween. And that's why the page views are actually down. So it helps you not only detect it, but also figure out like uh, help in terms of identifying the root cause. Um, so to just take a step back on uh, what, what is the key difference uh, here in terms of Pino versus any other systems which uh, claim to provide analytics, right? So the key difference here is most of the traffic that comes to Pino is coming via app. It's not a user who is sitting and writing SQL queries against Pino which is typically the case that happens with data warehouse or any other analytics tools. Um, so that's where the QPS is very, very high. And also the requirement is uh, very stringent in terms of the SLA because it's you're showing it to your end users, be it members of LinkedIn or customers of LinkedIn. Um, so it's important to achieve, have a very predictable SLA in, in, uh, in terms of latency and even at a very high throughput. Um, so in a way, it is it is really made to power apps um, that are providing analytics to their end users. Um, so in, in before we built, I mean, this was something that I was discussing with Andy before this is, in uh, 2014, we actually had a different version of Pino, which was uh, built on top of something like Elasticsearch, but it, it was an internal version built on top of Lucy, right? And one of the you know, problems that we hit at, uh, in 2014 was, the, we had to grow up to 1,000 nodes um, just for who viewed my profile use cases. And we had around uh, 200 plus million members at that point, right? And this was really, really expensive for us to uh, not only just manage and operate, uh, but it was a nightmare because the system was not scalable. We had to break the cluster into multiple uh, vertical shards. And we sort of did all sorts of things in terms of uh, trying to keep this cluster up and running. And once we identified all the problems on why this was um, this was not scaling, uh, we come we took on this journey, uh, journey of rewriting Pino from scratch. And uh, after after we scaled today, it is running at like seventy five nodes and serving five thousand queries per second at peak, right? And just serving like seven hundred million members. So this is kind of the change that we saw after we did all the performance improvements. And in the rest of the talk, I will cover like what actually enabled us to achieve this. Uh, but this is just to give you an idea of how important it is for us to address the bottlenecks of uh, throughput and be able to maintain the latency. Uh, so the second part here, I'm going to take a small use case in order to drive home the fact the latency is important and uh, as well as what it does to the throughput and what are all the techniques that people generally use to solve something like this. Um, so this is like we just took uh, the airline data analytics, uh, which is data from like 19, uh, 1987 to uh, all the way till 2008. And this has like close to 100 million rows. And you can see the cardinality of all these things. We stripped some of the metrics here, which was not very interesting. And the only metric that we actually had was the air time. So let's say someone wants to really build an application on top of it, right? And then these are some of the queries that someone wants to query, right? Um, just say like, hey, what is, tell me all the details about a particular trip ID. Or I want to know like, what is the total flying air time that across all the flights? Um, or how much, uh, what is the uh, air time for a particular flight number? Or across world region or unique. So you can think of any slicing and dicing combination of this. I have left out the time just for uh, clarity, but you can add time as well as a, as a query as part of your predicate. You can add group by all those things come into picture. But now let's take a look at how would one go about solving this, 
right? So a classic thing is like you store every flight record as each uh, one row, right? And then whenever the query comes, you do the aggregation on the flight. Um, so which is which is very well known, and you can end up end up doing that as a first approach. And if the data is small, you will always that's that's actually a pretty good enough solution in most cases. The second solution that most of them end up using is the pre-aggregation. So you take remove some of the things that are not of much interest. Let's say no one is asking you on the trip ID questions on the trip ID. You can take up the trip, and if the if the flight is between two uh, common destinations, you can actually aggregate that. Right, so then the, the amount of data collapses, and you, you might be able to get your performance much better. And then there's the other extreme, which was traditionally done uh, a lot, which is cubing, which is pre-compute every answer. So if you if someone asks like, how many flights traveled from Atlanta, you pre-compute that answer. How many flights traveled from Atlanta to San Francisco, you pre-compute that answer. So you basically, it's a classic OLAP cube, you compute every possible combination upfront. Now let's look at if we actually did this on these data sets, how would the latency actually translate, right? So I have one more column here with even with raw because indexing is a common technique that most people end up using. Um, so as you can see, the first query which took 50 milliseconds on uh, on this raw data with 107 million, uh, with index it became two milliseconds. With the pre-aggregate and the pre-cube, we can't really answer that question because we kind of lost that uh, record. So you don't really get the flexibility. Uh, but as you go down um, in the next, uh, if you ask for something like flight number 8617, this kind of has the, the maximum number of uh, uh, rows, and you can still get it at two milliseconds. And with the uh, with the pre-aggregation, you get to 40 milliseconds. Um, but with pre-cube, you can answer this question in two milliseconds, right? So this is this is kind of the benefit of uh, pre-cube. But now let's look at the third one where there is not much filtering, right? Where you're you're accessing the entire set of columns and entire set of rows. And here, the inverted index is not really helping us a lot. It's still one plus second. And with pre-aggregation, you can bring it to 240 milliseconds. And then with pre-cube, you can go to two milliseconds. Um, so the idea here is that the pre-cube is pretty much fast in across all, all these cases, right? Apart from the trip ID, which it cannot really solve, uh, you get like really, really good latency when you pre-cube it. But what is the downside of that? Right? I mean, it cannot be all that good. Uh, so the problem here is the number of records that it actually has adds up. Right? It's the the throughput is bad. Uh, in, sorry, the, the throughput is very very good. But then in terms of pre-cube, you are actually adding a lot more data. Right? So if you kind of look at it, it's a six x. If you look at the pre-aggregated data versus the pre-cube data, six x um, uh, increase in the data size. Typically, it is a lot more if you add more dimensions. For example, if we add date and trip, it, uh, trip ID just explodes. So we couldn't even compute all the combinations. It gets into billions at that point, and we kind of stopped it. Uh, and then, but with pre-aggregate, you can still get good uh, moment of uh, latency. But if you kind of look at the QPS, it is just 4.5, right? And the second, the inter most interesting thing here is the throughput for the raw index. While we saw that the individual queries latency were actually good, you can't really handle a lot of throughput just with the inverted index. And the reason is inverted indexes bring in a lot of um, data into the into the memory, into the system cache, and it just thrashes things left, right, and center. Right. So with, because of that, you are not able to get the QPS that you want. And whereas on the complete um, right-hand side of the pre-cube, you can get almost close to 1,800 plus QPS, right? And that's kind of what we were looking at because of the amount of people that are uh, using apps on LinkedIn. We wanted to make sure that we are uh, able to serve them. But if you kind of step back and then see this as a, in a summary view, right? So you have this three options. You have raw, pre-aggregate, and pre-cube. And you have one axis, which is performance, which kind of pre-cube is the best, but you kind of start losing the flexibility on this, right? And then if you look at storage, you have pretty good storage in terms of aggregation, but the raw events actually has high, and then the pre-cube is exponential. As you keep adding more dimensions, you just have to rebootstrap the data completely because it's not easy to add more dimensions to pre-cube. Um, so there are a lot of other issues with the pre-cube. So the challenge for us is like, hey, is there one system that can actually give all the three in one, right? And it's like, 
it gives you the flexibility and speed flexibility that you get from raw data you get the speed from the pre queue but at the same time you get a single data set abstraction right so you don't want users to basically say i want to keep one raw data set one aggregate one pre queue and then on my application layer depending on the query i will figure out what what view to actually access right so now think about all these things being baked into one one particular system under with a single table abstraction that's kind of what pino is um which gives you all these things all the features in just one system and you can pay the cost in terms of um uh, computing something up front uh versus computing everything on the fly there is also the the last part which is cost effective right which is you don't want to really do the pre queue because it's just very very expo uh, uh highly exp uh, exponential in terms of the data size um so that's where pino has this concept of start re index which allows you to go from one spectrum to another spectrum and be able to get the best across all these three things so i mean maybe you'll get to this but your idea just to repeat your idea of flexibility is that you're going to push to the application developer they have to decide whether they want to you know generate the data cube or whatever ahead of time right or like and is it but what does that look like like in terms of like the api is it like a knob you say hey i'm going to this query all the time could you feed a bunch of stuff for me or like this is a one off ad i think don't do that or is it or is the expectation of the database system finds this out automatically uh, so it's it's more of the former at this point it is okay. you can say that hey i want us i want i'm going to query these dimensions um you don't have to say the value of those dimensions you have to say that here are all the dimensions that i query often and then we can make that faster for that so you basically start off with no indexes nothing configured in pino and then you as you as you see that hey this query is slow you can almost think of hey make this query faster and then we generate the indexes on the fly so you don't have to really bootstrap the data this is more of a side comment and just if you can't say about what happens at linkedin anymore that's okay like how common were data cubes at linkedin sorry how common data cubes at linkedin how common like, yeah like like or people like were like were people in the gate guess the your, your previous lucene system was it blowing up in size that people were generating data cubes or no the, so there were there was another completely different system which was uh, generating data cubes all the time when yeah, we used okay. to store, store that in volume mode and that's how it used to be solved before this right so we would actually use a key value store and then you saw you know all the other problems that ends up yeah. ends up happening with like you using a key value store there so that's not what that, that's not what the Voldemort was first made for right like that no. i think it was so, yeah okay you just yeah, it was not made for that but he just <laughs> ended up using using it for uh, doing analytics and yeah. yeah okay all right keep going sorry um so what at a high level like what's what's apache pino you know? so it's a uh, real time data store which can basically ingest data from all streaming uh, sources as well as batch data sources right and at the same time uh, power use cases for be it internal uh, real time and applications or the data products which was the key uh, key use case for which it was built and we also have the anomaly detection on top of it which is constantly generating queries on top of this data and then being able to find out the, the root cause uh, in terms of the architecture um, so if we have like two main components we have the real time server which uh, kind of gets the data in just the data from kafka in real time and periodically it is generating segments and once the segments gets generated it, it does backup automatically in the segment store and then we have this offline servers uh, which can where you can actually push data from outside of pino as well so you can periodically generate segments and then keep pushing it to the offline servers so the broker is smart enough to figure out which ones are in offline which ones are in real time so that there is no overlap in in the data and we have uh, helix and the zookeeper that we use for our entire metadata store um in terms of the query query path um it's it's very simple here in terms of uh, how the entire query execution works um so you get the query which is a scan uh, and then the broker knows from helix on like what segments exist where how do i route to and it has all sorts of algorithms in terms of minimizing the number of machines that it needs to query or maximizing it or using the partition aware or time pruning 
So it, it has all these enhancements built in to prune the uh, segments as, as much as possible. And then it does a classic scatter gather here um, and then gets the response and then sends the response back to the client. Um, so very classic scatter gather uh, request model that's pretty much used in most of the other systems. Uh, in terms of uh, the actual execution, there is subtle difference compared to uh, traditional databases. Uh, we have uh, we don't have any optimization at the query level, so we don't really have a logical planner as such. Uh, what we actually end up doing is plan per segment. So every segment decides what is the right plan for uh, executing the query. So it can look at the segment uh, metadata. It can look at what kind of indexing it has. Uh, and then decide, come up with the actual plan. So you can think of one of them having inverted index, the other one doesn't have inverted index. So it can figure out what is the right way to structure this, how should the predicates be reordered, all these things is at a, uh, at a physical level and not at a logical level. So there is a little bit of overhead that we pay for this, but it, uh, it helps us a lot in terms of the query uh, uh, performance itself. Um, in terms of the anatomy of the segment, um, so we pretty much map everything. So we don't store anything in memory. So we have the concept of the pnode data buffer. And around that is what we have is all the indexing techniques. So we have the dictionary for encoding. We have forward index, inverted index, range. So we have a lot of, lot of indexes that are built in in Pino. And then we have the, the column concept around that, which is basically in each individual column uh, storage. And segment basically just wraps up all these things. And the segment can actually be mutable or immutable. So a mutable segment is something that can keep accepting more, more records on the fly. And all these indexes are getting updated on the fly as well. Uh, whereas an immutable one is created upfront and then pushed into Pino. And that, uh, that doesn't really change over time. Um, that's a lot more efficient than the mutable one. And all the mutable ones periodically keep getting converted into immutable. Uh, a brief. You, sorry, is, do you do any like with your? your so you said you're using MMAP. Are you using any of like MMBIs or like? Is there like? How hard are you pushing the OS to make MMAP work for you? Uh, we pretty much rely on the OS for pretty you now for pretty much everything in terms okay. of uh, we don't we don't do anything on top of it. We don't manage any of the buffer pool or any of those things. No, I know, but like I mean, do do you are using MMBIs or like the other? Like tricks you can do to make MMAP like yeah do we do touch, we do touch some files when they're getting loaded uh, so okay. we do some some sort of tricks there but not not exhaustive tricks in, uh, in that uh, that other databases too yeah, okay thanks um so as I mentioned earlier right so one of the key things for us was to have all sorts of uh, was the need for having all these various indexing the philosophy of of Pino to certain extent was to not figure out less, I mean, most of the databases do the vectorization, do the SIMD and all those things to make things faster. Uh, for us, it was not sufficient to just do that. It, we had to go beyond that in terms of how can we reduce the amount of work done, right? I mean, you can always scan and filter, uh, which traditional databases do. For us, it was more about how can we eliminate the work that is needed. So that's why we added all these sorts of, all sorts of indexing. So we have sorted, inverted, range, text, geo, star tree, bloom filter, JSON, and we, are, we keep adding more and more indexes. So we have built the, uh, the system in a way that adding these indexes is actually very, very easy for us. And as I mentioned earlier, we also have this concept of storing the raw events, pre-aggregate and the pre-cube, everything in the same abstraction. And all of them will be stored in the columnar fashion. Um, so the key thing for us is like really the, not only to have all these uh, techniques, but also have an optimizer or a planner which can pick the right techniques based on the query so that the user doesn't really have to say, oh, you use this index or use the other index. You just run the query and then we pick the right index that is needed. For all these indexes, did you guys write these from scratch yourself or are there off the shelf ones you're using? Uh, most of them were uh, something that we built from scratch. Uh, the only one that we use is the roaring bitmap, um, which yeah, is a course. like. Yeah. yeah. Um, Daniel Lemire. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Everything else. I mean, we do use the underlying library, for example, geo index. Uh, we use the H3 uh, from Uber. Exactly. Yeah. Um, exactly. Something like that. But our yeah. others, we, we end up building ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, that was my next one. Is the, is the spatial index, the geo index is the software. I was surprised if you guys read that yourself. But yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Keep going. Yeah, we don't want this. Nobody does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so just to illustrate, I mean, the, each of these indexing is actually a talk by itself. So unfortunately, I won't be able to deep dive into these uh, individual topics, right? I want, I want to, the only thing that I will be focusing on is on the starting index in the next section. Um, um, so the key thing here is uh, to just show, demonstrate like what, are, what is the power of all these indexes that we have. So we took this five years of GitHub data for, to demonstrate this. It has like 2.6 billion rows. It's just a single node that we used and it's like close to 400 gigs of data, right? And you can see the schema on the left. Um, so just to give an idea of what happens with and without index, right? So the first one is like, hey, just tell me how many events happen between these two timestamps. And without index, it basically looks, uh, takes like 32 seconds. And with just time partition, which is without any of the other indexing, we bring it down to like one second. And if you kind of want to ask like, hey, how many commits or events does a particular uh, user has performed? And with just with inverted index, you can actually get it to 15 milliseconds from two seconds, right? And then the other one is like, you can you can just look at it. So pretty much everything uh, we have like range index gets from 40 to uh, uh, three seconds, right? So you use this whenever you want to do a range on a numeric value. So if you want to say, tell me all the commits that had hundred plus uh, changes, lines changed, right? So you can use something like range index. Inverted index doesn't really work very well for that. You can look at text index, which tell, tells you like how many comments had this message, right? So you can kind of include all these different uh, mechanisms and JSON indexing is something that's not uh, specified uh, in this, but we that is another thing that we added. So overall, you can look at this and then think about all these different uh, things in terms of metrics or logs and traces. Um, so you can use these techniques to address each of the specific use cases that you have in your system. And it's very, very powerful. You just pointed it first into ingest the data into Pino. And then after that, you, you, you add and remove indexes on the fly. You don't have to do, it's not stop the world, like alter the table in typical databases. You can just add it on the fly and then in, in the background, the indexes get, keep getting generated. Do you, do you support joins? No. Uh, so the one of the one of the key decisions for us is to not go beyond one table. So we want to be the fastest single table query engine. And for the the joins on the outside, we actually end up using with Presto. So we have a very small, very powerful connector with Presto. And what we do is we look at the query plan and then see how much ever we can push down to Pino, we push it and then uh, the rest of the uh, parts of the join we actually perform in Presto. And we also have the Spark connector. Um, so that's kind of what we end up using. So we focus on the performance on a single table with all the indexing and things like that. And we have a streaming connector for Presto. So that means it's, it's not waiting for the results to be uh, completely uh, processed and computed on Pino side. So as they're getting computed in blocks and chunks, we are actually streaming it back to Presto so that you're getting uh, getting the benefits of the streaming connector as well. Um, so this is a, a new thing that we also added, which is JSON indexing. Um, so until now, we act only supported structured data in Pino. Uh, so we have recently added the ability to um, get uh, unstructured data as well. So if you look at it, you can say like, hey, tell me someone who lived in Fun Street. Right. So it, without index, it takes like 18 seconds. And now with every every field in the in the JSON being indexed, you can you can pretty much ask any sort of questions, even at any depth. Right. Um, this is this is this syntax is uh, we use we use the JSON path. So if you this is like who addresses of zero is like the first entry of that. You can say addresses of star. That means anyone who lived on Fun Street, you basically get that. So this the syntax is very very flexible here. So you can almost do like the JSON path expressions here in, in terms of finding finding uh, the, the records that match your query. All right. So that brings us to our starter index. So, so are you do are you guys doing any like vectorized processing as you're scanning say like numeric columns? Yes. So we try to keep as much as possible in terms of uh, blocks. So when yeah. we scan it, so we do convert them into block arrays and then we try to do the vectorized processing. We don't have the SIMD yet, okay. uh, but we try to do the vectorized as much as possible. 
So everything is stored in a block of 10K or 5K. Okay. And then is it, I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's all written in Java. So I, actually, I, I have no idea. I'm sure you can do SIMD processing, SIMD, you know, SIMD instructions in Java. Like, but that, that sort of affects the portability of it. No. Yes, right definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, all right, fair enough. All right, keep going. All right, so let's quickly go back and then a uh, little bit of a recap on the solution that we thought about, right? Which is hey, we could use raw index, uh, raw data without index or with index or pre aggregate and pre queue. Uh, what we really want is like almost like the best of all these worlds, right? So we want like achieve the pre throughput of pre cubing, uh, but we also want to get the flexibility of raw data so that we can answer any sort of questions even which is not uh, solved with the pre cube. Uh, but then we also don't want to pay this high storage cost. We don't want to keep computing all possible cubes. We don't want to have this explosion in the data. Um, so that's kind of where Stardry really comes into picture, right? Which is, can we go from any of the spectrum from one side to another without actually paying a lot of cost? Um, so let me double click a little bit in terms of why we actually need a start key, right? Because inverted index is kind of quite powerful for majority of the use cases. So if you kind of look at it in, in this particular thing, um, with inverted index, you have this latency of two, six, and 120 milliseconds. And as you see, it's really impacted by the number of rows or the selectivity of the query. So some queries can be fast, some queries can actually be very slow, right? So if you ask like, uh, tell me everything about the flights that came in and uh, went to Atlanta. It's like almost uh, which is five million, five million rows that needs to be scanned on the flight, right? So there is no way you can make this fast. Um, so other classic example is you have ads data, and you want to say like how many impressions were there in US. So inverted index is not going to do a lot here because you have to scan fifty percent of your data anyways. So your latency is completely bounded. Uh, or uh, decided by the amount of scan that you need to do once the filtering is done. And this high variance is really, really bad for query, uh, for user-facing analytics, because what happens is most of the time, the ones that are very popular are the ones that actually get a lot of queries as well. And you end up seeing that they are the ones which are, which are the slowest and which is not really good for, uh, for user-facing analytics. So if you kind of want to get one, one key thing from this talk, I think this is this is the core concept of uh, of starter index. So what this means is like instead of saying that hey every query can take as many seconds as many milliseconds as needed, what if we can completely bound it? Any query of this form, right? Which is like select sum of x from table and where you can put any sort of any combination of your uh, predicates. And what if we say that hey it should never scan more than t records? irrespective of the combination. Um, if you kind of look at it in this, it, one is scanning one record, the other one is 91K, and the other one is like five, 5 million, right? What if we say that all these queries should just scan only 10,000 records? So that's kind of where the starter concept comes in. And it's based on this traditional iceberg, iceberg cubing model, where you compute only partial aggregates. You don't really compute full aggregates. And that's kind of the model that we used uh, but what it was what it was built was for a single uh, single uh, node and we took that concept and we can continue to use the columnar store and built it in a distributed model so this is another way to look at what this threshold really means right so if you kind of look at on the leftmost extreme that's basically your raw data so you are not doing any any materialization at all you're just keeping the threshold, uh, the data as it is, and all your queries basically go there. But the problem with this, as we see, is the latency is uh, widely varying, right? It can be anywhere from two, two milliseconds to 100 plus milliseconds or even seconds, depending on the data. But whereas on the other extreme, where if you say the threshold is basically one, that means you are pre-cubing pre and you're computing everything. And the beauty of this is, you kind of see the curve on, in terms of the storage requirements and the latency. You actually, as if, even if you compute only some of the partial aggregates, you will be able to achieve a lot of lot better latency uh, without having to get, get all the way to the right extreme. And that's kind of where star tree comes into picture. So you basically, when you configure star tree, you can say, what is this threshold that you want? That if for any of these queries of this form, I don't want to scan more than 10,000 records or 100,000 records. 
or even one in which case it just does complete pre cubing so that's that's the beauty of this and it's a knob that you control and you can figure out like how how fast you want the response time to be and how much you are willing to give up in terms of the additional storage overhead um any questions here but the knob you're exposing isn't like i want you know my my sla for this query to be 50 milliseconds right it's just the split special here right so how how is somebody supposed to figure that out uh, so typically what we end up doing is every uh, query we actually tell how many scans actually happen for that particular query so you can and so let's say you have you get 100 milliseconds and you see the number of records that is getting scanned and it's 1 million so you can actually do the math and then your idea is to basically get it down you you say that okay this query should not scan more than 100 than 10 records you basically just look at that ratio and then say that if you want to get it down by 10x you reduce you set the latency to the threshold to 10, uh, one tenth of the records that it's actually scanned. So, so I think you could do that, but most people are stupid, right? Like that's, I, I think we yeah, so really want- Yeah, so okay. the idea here is to basically get into the mode of uh, auto-tuning, right? In, instead of, so, so the first approach is to basically give the control to the users. If someone knows it, they can definitely set it and figure out what is the actual threshold. Uh, but the idea for us is once we understand this, uh, the data, we, we have other APIs on top of it, which can figure out it just yeah. make this way faster, right? Uh, yeah. But it's, it's really about tuning the system since everything is dynamic. You are basically putting something outside the system that is constantly monitoring this and making it faster. That's so you cool. can think about, oh, these types of queries are running more and more. Um, very often, now we, we want to optimize such queries. So you can just set up only for those things. Okay, all right, thanks. So let's look at what, why is this? threshold really important, right? So this is kind of the graph on going the threshold from almost like one, uh, which is the pre-cube on the rightmost side, uh, to no nothing which is on the leftmost side, right? So if you, earlier we looked at um, the raw data could only handle like one query per second, whereas the pre-cube can handle like 1800, um, uh, 1880 queries per second, right? So if you look at in the star tree, by providing some threshold of just a thousand without um, if you look at the data size increase right from the pre cube to pre aggregate to this it's literally adding like 53 million uh, million records whereas the pre cube is adding one 185 million records uh, which is like six times your uh, the pre aggregate data so you have this curve that you get um, and you can see from if you want like just 100 QPS, you can basically get your start rate uh, threshold to 100, 100, 100K, and you should be able to get to 235 queries per second. So this curve is like, it's not it's definitely not linear, but the nice thing about it is you don't really have to compute all possible combinations, and you just set this right threshold, and with that, you will be able to get the, the QPS that you really want. At the same time, the you are, you are not losing the flexibility, right, and you can, add more dimensions, you can evolve the schema as it is, and you can still query the trip ID, you can query on the time, you can do pretty much everything. The, the query uh, engine is smart enough in order to figure out which, uh, can I use the strategy or should I call back to the raw data? And that's kind of the idea here is to give that control to the user and it's one system. You can actually start from the leftmost with just using the raw data, start with one QPS, and as your load increases, you are just adding adding more indexes or even going all the way to start to index uh, to get the performance that you need. So you don't really have to change your systems. You don't have to re-bootstrap the data. It's, it's all dynamic and you continue to use the same system for all your use cases. And one of the benefits that we have seen is at LinkedIn is most of them start on the leftmost, which is like very low when the products are launched, their QPS is not very high. But as they gain more and more popularity, the QPS increases quite a bit. Uh, so we always had this problem of starting with one system, moving to another system over a period of time as it becomes popular. And with all these indexing techniques and uh, starter index, we can basically stay with one, one particular system. It's just a configuration change for us. Hey, um, a question, this uh, page is from Cloudera here. So uh, when you talk about QPS, is it uh, is the system running one query at a time or 
uh, is it sequential yes for this uh, setup it is sequential because that's how we wanted to get the max out of this it's a single core uh, machine and running as fast as possible in terms of uh, sequential queries so if you look at this in in a second it can answer like 1800 1800 queries okay thanks um, I think I've put that somewhere in the footnote in one of the slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks for asking that. All right, so, so the next part comes into how do we actually generate this, um, generate this index, right? So this is, there are a lot of uh, methods in how you can do it. There is top down, bottom up computation, if you can do parallelism and a bunch of things like that. But at a very, very high level, the way we want to think about it is just take the raw data first and then we first figure out from a root node. So this is like the, the right, whatever is seen on this is the actual index and the left side, uh, what you are seeing is the actual columnar data. So we take the raw data and then we first figure out what should be the sorting order of this, right? And typically what we first pick is the one with the highest cardinality. And the reason for that is basically to avoid the explosion. So you can think about it in the reverse reverse order. If, uh, if you kind of just remove gender from, um, from one of your data sets and you compress it, the max you can get compression is 50%. Whereas if you remove a very high cardinality, let's say trip ID, you will get the maximum compression. So the idea here is to pick the, uh, the dimension with the highest cardinality to first compress. And what we do once we sort on that, and then we create this star tree, which is the green node on the right side, where we remove the country dimension from the data, and then we compress everything, right? And then you continue this process until each node has, um, un until the, each node drops below the threshold that we have actually specified. And that's kind of the idea here in terms of how we compute this uh, tree. So as, as we adding computing pre-aggregate records, we kind of keep appending uh, each of them to the actual columnar store. And in each node, we actually maintain what it actually points to in the columnar database, what is the start and end of each of them. And at the same time, we also compute, uh, store some pre-aggregates on the node itself. So we kind of have these two data structures now. One is the star tree, on, which is gets keep getting updated as, as we keep uh, scanning over the data and keep creating this tree. And every time we create a star node, we add more records onto the columnar database on the other side. Um, so it's, it's like a hybrid structure. You have this B plus tree kind of a thing on the right. At the same time, you have the columnar. So it, you're kind of getting the best of two worlds in some way. And I'll talk about like how we use this index um, to actually talk about the to, uh, during the query processing. So this is how it looks like. Um, so if you look at this, it has like three colors, right? So one is the blue, which basically means that the node is has more records that it will further uh, divide into sub subchildren. And in the star node, if you look at it, points to another set of records which has the it has lost the country dimension. So the idea here is that this is almost like your another materialized view each star node is creating a materialized view automatically but it will not create all the pre cubes but it will only create the table if the number of records is greater than t so that's where the threshold comes into picture um this is how in the end the tree will be organized so you have a top level tree of which has all the dimensions of your data with some bunch of star nodes and they point at uh uh, the right section within uh, within the columnar database on where it actually each node starts and ends. Um, so this is, I mean, it was it's very hard to show them in, but I'll I'll kind of show this. So this is actually how the tree looks like um, for the airline data. So you see, all the individual nodes are created under the first. So the first dimension was flight. Right. And then here is the star node. So we call the star node as this all node. Right. So everything now under this has lost the flight dimension, flight number. And the next dimension that gets picked up is the tail number because that's the next cardinality that comes into picture with highest cardinality. 
and once we further divide and then we get into the destinations here right so so one of the key things to note here is there are two different kind of nodes right so one is the blue which further opens up what that means is they have they have not there's they have they have more num more than the threshold number of records and the elm for example is less than the threshold so it doesn't divide further so the cubing basically stops at that particular point so this is the any any index can be we have built this viewer so you can just point at it and then you can pretty much see what is the the way the tree is built and each of these leaf nodes basically point at the has the start and end which points at the actual database start and end goes um so that comes to the the query execution part itself right so now there are so many different types of queries and how do what node does it actually use to answer the query the first one is let's say we want to say what is the number of page views where country equals al um, so it starts off with the root right and then it looks at what are all the filter predicates and then it takes the first branch because there is an attribute on uh, predicate on country it gets to the country node and then it says oh i have actually reached the reach the leaf and there is nothing more i need to do and it uses that subset of records to actually do the query processing and if it is just uh, if it can just answer that and there is no other filtering uh, it will just use that node and then answer the query so you basically get the answer very very quickly and you take a sec second record which is um, country equals ca right and then in that case ca doesn't really have the answer at that it goes into the next node which is star and then it picks up the answer from that uh, similarly for the chrome um, it it doesn't it doesn't really need any country right so it actually takes the star node first and then goes goes into the chrome node and it it has the answer that is already uh, either pre computed or it's available on the uh, on the actual uh, number of records and it answers the query from that um so the idea here is basically you use this tree to figure out like hey which node should i uh, use uh, to answer my query and then you go to the end of that and then pick pick the right node uh, to answer your query and uh, as you see on the right side any any pattern any query of this pattern will always scan less than the threshold that we have de de defined because it will always go to the leaf to process and every leaf will have less than uh, the threshold number of records that's kind of the high level high level idea in terms of how um, startry is structured and how we actually use it for query processing uh, so one of the cool things that we actually added recently is you can even generate multiple trees right it's you can say that hey i want this tree for only this set of dimensions i want this tree for only this set of dimensions so you can dynamically add and remove these uh, trees as well um so you can say that hey i want one star tree which just takes care of country browser and time and if a query comes with anything with combination of country and browser it will hit star tree a and you can also have another set of combinations which is os device and time and anything that comes with os and device it will go there if something comes across country and os then it might end up going into the raw events or you can create another one for that or you can create a default one with all the dimensions so the idea here is that you have a lot of lot of flexibility in terms of picking and choosing the common dimensions that you you often query and you always have the raw events for you to answer anything that doesn't fit in the tree and the planner is smart enough to know what is the best tree for uh, that needs to be picked up to answer this query so it does some some sort of optimization or evaluation in terms of picking the best tree here so um anything else that's there yeah so the the way it picks up is just based on the query itself it looks at what are the columns needed what is the group by ordering and uh, what are all the columns that are uh, that are appearing the query i'm assuming it's the heuristics right you just it's like if it needs this and i have it use it right it's not it's not a cost based search uh, if if there are multiple trees then it uses the smallest tree if the multiple trees can actually solve it then it uses the smallest tree but yeah but the idea it's, it's, it's still can, heuristics yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's it's not doing dynamic programming it's not no, 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 yeah. not it's it, yeah the cost is too high to do that i don't know how often are the queries like are extremely similar right like it's like in your case like looking up airlines and country code 
imagine it's just like you replace that country code over on, you know, the, the, the value of the country code parameter over and over again. Right? So you, could, you do have a cache and prepared statements. Possibly, okay. yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, we haven't done that. Yeah, it's definitely possible to push it beyond this. Are you doing any kind of like sort of costless rewriting? Like A equals one and B equals A, you can rewrite that as like A equals you know one and B equals one, something like that. Do you do any of those tricks? No, not yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, that's a high level overview of, I mean, there's a lot that we can get into the star tree, but I just kept it at a very high level. It, it's a talk by itself, if, but I had to put some time in terms of getting you all, all of you up to speed on Tino itself. Uh, but in terms of what's coming up next, uh, so we do have an upset feature um, that's also supported in Tino that we added recently. Um, so it's the data can be mutated. Uh, one of the new things that we are adding is partial updates. So that means the updates coming in doesn't have to have all the columns. Uh, so we will actually look, look up the previous value of that and then update it. And the second, but the most uh, often asked from the community is the native object store. Um, I think, you know, right now, uh, the segment is local to, uh, to the, the node that it is serving. So it uses the POSIX APIs. Uh, what we will be doing here is uh, directly be able to store the segments in S3 and be able to access that, right? So that uh, it's, it doesn't have to be local, it can be remote. Um, so that will be one of the uh, cool things that we will be working on. If uh, anyone is interested in working and contributing to this project, we will we'll love to get in touch with them. Uh, the geo indexing is the next one that uh, Uber folks uh, really wanted this as part of uh, the Uber Eats application. Um, so you can now start doing um, geo queries like, hey, tell me how many riders are in this area, how many um, Uber Eats are available and things like that. Uh, so we will continue to optimize on the Presto Trino and uh, Spark connectors. Um, the, as, as I mentioned, our goal is to um, focus heavily on the single table uh, implementation of Trino and making, uh, providing all sorts of indexing and optimizations. And for the joins and uh, window functions and nested queries, we will be relying on Presto to actually do the do the job there. Um, out, of your, out of curiosity, of those three, Pino, Presto, and Spark, which one is most used? Like your people uh, using Pino. Uh, Presto DB is the one that's used most. Okay. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the connectors, I mean, yeah. Trino is also getting a lot more adoption right now. Um, so I would say Presto and Trino together is probably the the most often used. Okay. Hi, uh, hi, I'm Rohan. I am a student. I was a student at uh, Andy's lab. So I had a small question that when you update, like you mentioned that, that you use uh, this with real time data also, right? So when you update a raw data node, there will be multiple upward pathways in the, uh, the star tree that you need to update, right? Because all of the different analytics that that raw data node points to change. So in that case, how do you achieve like concurrent operations in the star tree tree? Because like most B plus tree concurrent operations work when the queries are along one way, right? But if they are on the upward direction also, then there can be a lot of conflicts with the locking and all this. Yeah, so two things. So yeah, one, one wanted to make sure. So the, the star tree will never is not getting built on a mutable uh, segment. So we remember I had a concept of mutable and immutable. Uh, so the mutable, we don't generate the segment. It just uh, started, it's just too expensive, as you mentioned. It's not uh, worth the cost. And since it's only the one that is uh, the recent segment, uh, only when it gets flushed, when it gets converted into an immutable segment, that's when we generate the starter. So the starter itself is very uh, limited to a segment and it's not across all segments. And the second part is on the upsets part, we haven't supported the star tree yet even when there is upsets. It's only for the immutable data um, that star tree is available. Hope that answered your question. And the second yeah. one is each, each segment is always uh, in the right path is single threaded. So there is no concurrency in the right path. There are not multiple guys writing to the same segment. So we simplified that on the application layer instead of trying to handle all the concurrency within within the start of the Thank you, thank you very much. And um, so the J JDBC adapter is uh, available right now. So something that we, um, so looks like someone had a question. Yeah, uh, Rohan, 
uh, even from the chat or? Someone raised hand. So what does? Oh, uh, Cecilia, go for it. Yes. Just, just, just unmute yourself. Unless her hand shouldn't be raised. Okay. I, I, I would lower her hand. If she wants to come back, she can come back. Okay. Got yeah. Uh, so the other part is the uh, we want to add beyond uh, Kafka. So Kafka is the only uh, streaming that is supported right now. So we are planning to add Kinesis and uh, PubSub connector as well as part of this. Um, there are some changes in terms of how we plan to handle Kinesis. The PR is in progress. PubSub will be the next one that we will be taking on. Uh, so that kind of uh, leads to the, the question and answer session. I do want to call, up, call out that there is another meetup coming tomorrow where we will be talking more about upsert and JSON indexing and uh, how it's uh, getting used at Uber for the Uber Eats app. Um, uh, feel free to reach out as on anywhere here um, on the Twitter account or on the Slack channel. So most of our community is on the Slack channel. Uh, so we'll be happy to help you with your use case. And and as you see, there are so many different uh, indexing. When to use what is definitely a challenge. It's not uh, it's not trivial, but we are happy to help there. All right. Okay, awesome. I will clap on behalf of everyone else. Okay, we have time. Uh, great talk. We have time for a few questions. If you have a question, please just meet yourself and then uh, go ahead and ask it. Thank you. Okay, I have lots of questions. Good. <laughs> Very selfish of me. To everyone else, I'm going to ask. Oh, uh, thank. So, what is the main bottleneck for you guys now? Right, you have the index. You have, uh, you know, you have you. We have a bunch of indexes, but like, what is the? Assuming everything's in memory, what's been the critical path for you? Like, what's the thing that is slowing you down? Is it the JVM itself? Is it? Uh, is it the APIs or reading the data from, from, from disk? But only S3 is a total different thing, right? That's always going to be slow. That's not your problem. Like what, mm -hmm. What's the main bottleneck for you guys right now? So for us, the, the there are two things. One is on the forward index scan itself is the random, because we are, since we use random, um, sorry, indexes, most mm -hmm. of our access patterns will be random. It's not going to be sequential. Got it. Right. So, so our our key challenge will be like, how do we trade off between the compression decompression at the runtime versus the random lookup, right? And how do we how do we really try to organize the data in a way that we minimize the number of random lookups? Right? Is sorting going to help? Is should we reorder the data because it doesn't really matter from the user point of view? So yes. we do some of the things. So we actually have a concept of a partition ID. We have a concept of a sorted ID. So you can specify the columns that you want it to be sorted on. So when we flush the segment, we actually resort, reorganize. Uh, so we play a lot of tricks on the data locality, but we are not in a state where we can do that automatically. So the user has to know a little bit about uh, the use case for him to tell us, like, how do we organize the data? For example, if uh, for who viewed my profile, we actually sort the data on the UE ID so that when yeah, when your who would my profile opens up, we actually don't even use inverted index for who would my profile. It's just the sorted index. So we just go to that location directly and we see that filtering based on the scanning is actually much faster than filtering based on inverted index. But for that to happen, we actually have to sort the data up front um, and that we do that dynamically. So the data locality part is one thing. And the second one is like the, the trade off between like how, how big should we go on compression? Versus like, so that's always a uh, problem that do we compress more and pay cost at the runtime or do we compress less and make the queries faster and the storage is more expensive at that time, which basically mm -hmm. leads to more uh, thrashing in terms of page cache. So those, those are some of the trade-offs that we are working on. Um, and the third is on the CPU itself, uh, we are uh, seeing some cache misses in L1 and L2 caches. So that's okay. something that we want to figure out uh, when the cardinality is very high. How do we actually uh, make sure that there is no lot, there's a lot of cash misses on the L1 and L2 cash. But that's like the next level that we want to get into. Um, but, okay, okay. All right, uh, there's a question from the chat from Steve Moy. Uh, it says, is the internal wire columnar format uh, based on Apache Arrow, considering you're trying to integrate with the Presto, Trino, and Spark? 
so the internal format is not arrow unfortunately because uh, we had built this much before arrow existed and uh, in fact we our format internally is has a lot of things that arrow has uh, but it's a map it's not in memory format unlike the arrow one and we don't we cannot really bring it into memory with so many segments so arrow is still a very good format for the over the wire uh, but on on disk we make sure that we can m map and we don't have to really deserialize anything we can just access yeah. in, in any data directly uh, so we have our own pino you know, segment format um, but we have all sorts of access patterns there we have multi value single value list keys and maps all those things okay. uh, what was the second one um, so that is, it was it was asking are you using arrow because you cuz you commented like we're trying to, you're trying to integrate with presto tree on spark so yes. if, they're, if they're using Arrow on the wire protocol, then you can do the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any last question?